two daycare centers, and over 100 units, units of affordable housing. So without further ado, should we have to do that? Separate drinking times. 
We talk about the laws uh, that I can't walk down a certain street or I can't own certain property. But this law that says if you're poor, we're going to do everything in our power to keep you poor, to manage you in your poverty, is still in existence. So, what my mother did was break the law. She would work uh, scrubbing people's floors. She would throw rent parties while we were living in public housing. Um, she would have uh, rent parties when you have chicken dinners and you sell the dinner by the plate and you make enough money in one night to pay your rent. Now, rent parties were major where you get kicked out if, you, if they find you, etc. Um, I was not a fan of chickens. Um, every time she had a rent party, I ran away from home uh, for that night of the week. For her, and others like her, cleaning someone else's floor and earning money doing so was a crime. For her, feeding your children was a crime. I'm glad to say that she took that on herself and that she, uh, that, that she raised us. The real crime and the real criminals were the creation of a system that criminalizes a mother's love for her children. There's nothing immoral in what my mother did. The immorality was in the society, not in her actions. This is the same thing that King and Gandhi and others like him face, that the immorality wasn't in these laws. The immorality was in the consciousness that passes laws like this in the first place. The criminals are those who create and maintain systems that perpetuate poverty. Now, this is true around the world. I have been around the world more times than I care to count right now. Um, First time you go around the world, you say, hey, I've been around the world. The second time, like, hey, you've been around the world. The fourth or fifth time, like, oh, God, I've been around the world again. Um, and I have seen poverty at levels that we can only imagine. I've seen and talked to the people who are earning a dollar a day or less working, back-breaking work for 10 or 12 hours a day for one dollar. I've eaten in the villages of people who I knew that the food that they were putting on the table for me was all the food they had. And I knew that the things that they had to do to, to feed themselves, to clothe their children, to keep a roof over their head, these things where they were have to be forced to make choices that no human being should make. But my definition of poverty is being forced by your circumstances to make a bad choice. So my mother had to make a bad choice. The choice that she could have to make was either feed yourself, feed your children, keep a roof over their head, or do something that will break the law. She should not have had that as her choices. There's a, a person in India that's going to sell their kidney to put food on, the, on, the, on the, the table for their family, should not have to make that choice. I want us to create a world where no one is forced into choices like that. I think that that's the legacy of Martin Luther King. I think that's the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi. And that's the unfinished business that we've got to face here. We can talk about um, honoring Martin Luther King by having speeches. We can talk about honoring Martin Luther King by playing spirituals or showing film clips of a situation that existed in this country 40 or 50 years ago. 
Or we can honor Dr. King by looking at what's happening right now. Yeah. Not what's happening, what's happening right now. Yeah. I want to read something to you from one of my books, uh, The Power of One, Authentic Leadership in Turbulent Times. In the book I say, the time has come for a new understanding of power and leadership. The old ways simply don't work anymore. The old explanations don't explain anything. Our current system is no longer adequate for our needs. Our society has gotten far too complex for any one person to understand. We act, having no idea why we act. We fumble around looking for direction as we head closer to the chasm. In a time of chaos, we see all the dangers and none of the opportunities. We drift, bickering, fighting, arguing about who's to blame for the present morass. All of us must share the blame. We fail because deep down inside, we don't feel the problem even has a solution. We propose alternatives as a gesture, out of guilt, with the deep belief that nothing will change for our efforts. We continue to place implicit faith and trust in institutions which constantly fail us. We do this because the alternative is to admit our own failures. This simply must stop. The time called for a revolution, a revolution in consciousness. That is the purpose of this book. And I'll say this, that's also the purpose of our time here today, a revolution in consciousness. In this country, Martin Luther King began that revolution, but that was the beginning. He didn't end it, it, did, it wasn't over in 1965. What we have to do is continue the revolution. Now, what are the ways that we continue it? Well, let me show you one way we don't do it, and then one way that we will do it. It's not about protest. It's not about protesting things. Neither Gandhi nor King were protesters. They didn't leave, leave waves of people shouting, death to Britain, or smash racism. Instead of protest, they were master practitioners of what I call vision implementation. Not civil disobedience. Civil disobedience focuses on what you're not doing. It focuses on the negative energy stream. But, but by vision implementation, what you are doing is having a vision of a society and then implementing that vision. Now, those who don't share that vision of society want to do their very best to try to stop you. And that's where the, the action starts. What Gandhi did by leading the famous salt march to lead the thousands of people to go to the beach and make salt is said to the British government, you are not in control of this country, we are. When King said, okay, you don't want us on those buses, we'll walk. When the, when the Folks in Greensboro said, I'll walk into the Woolworths and sit down and order a hamburger and a Coke. What they were doing was implementing the kind of society they wanted to, to live in. And by implementing that, they forced the power structure of its time into an action. What they had to do was either let them do this, which means they won, or come out against it and look bad in the eyes of the world until they stop doing it, in which case they won. So this is the ultimate win-win strategy. 